I will never live up to that. <laughs> but I want to add my thanks to Christine's for all of you for uh, your generosity and giving up a perfectly good evening to listen to a total stranger talk about rocks. I'm delighted to be here in this picture-perfect library in this picture-perfect town. I haven't been to Windsor yet, but I can never say that again. In honor of the occasion, I brought my very finest table linen to protect the top of this table from what I am going to do to it. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the history of our New England stone walls and then tell you a little bit about how they're made and how their styles emerged and changed over time. I'm going to give you just a little bit of information about some of these other books that I've brought because as sad as it is to say, I am not the only person who ever wrote a book about New England stone walls. Then I'm going to come to the part of the program that is always my favorite and that's answering any questions that you have or if I have flipped through any section of this uh, a little too quickly and you'd like some elaboration, please don't hesitate to take me back to anything uh, that I haven't given you enough of. But I want to start by talking about a particular year as soon as I offer a short disclaimer, which is this. If you happen to be sitting in a place where you can't really see what I'm doing on this tabletop very well, please don't worry about it. It has nothing at all to do with what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to keep my hands busy. <laughs> I like to start with a particular year, a very important year in the history of New England stone wall building, as it turns out, and that year was 1871. In 1871, our esteemed U.S. Department of Agriculture decided that it would be a marvelous idea to take inventory of all the fencing in the United States. And so they worked on this terribly important project for about a year or so and then released an enormous report full of many facts. Among them was this one, that in the six New England states and the state of New York combined, in other words, the northeast corner of the United States, there were more than 250,000 miles of stone wall. 250,000 miles. That is more than the total amount of railroad track in this country. It is more by quite a long way than the entire length of the U.S. coastline. It is, in fact, enough stone wall to go all the way around the world ten times. It's even enough stone wall, this is the last one, it's even enough stone wall to stretch from the street outside this library in a straight line to the surface of the moon. There are two marvelous things about this number. First one is that it's wrong. <laughs> it's too low by a lot. And that is because the federal report on fencing only concerned itself with what it said it concerned itself with, which was barriers between sections of farmland. In other words, fencing. Whereas anybody who's been in New England for more than 15 minutes is well aware that there are a great many things great many more things built out of dry laid stone, that is to say stone structures in which the individual members of the construction are not held together by any adhesive, any mortar, any cement, anything except the skill of the builder and the, their own weight. There are a great many more structures built out of dry laid stone than merely straightforward fencing. <laughs> they <laughs> include ramps and causeways and stairways and culvert headers and the old town pounds and stone lined wells and of course thousands and thousands of foundations under houses and barns of all kinds, buildings of all kinds. Taken together with the 250,000 miles plus of straightforward dry laid stone wall, it's by estimated by, been estimated by some people who perhaps became a little overstimulated by this number uh, that <laughs> there is more dry laid stone in the northeastern United States and there is in all the rest of the world combined. This is not an assertion I'm personally prepared to back up. However, I will say that simply the fact that this comparison was made should give you some idea of the almost incredible communal architectural accomplishment that these walls and other dry stone structures represent here in the Northeast. For instance, the entire nation of Great Britain 
where they have been building in dry laid stone for at least 5,000 years, if not longer, has in it only 70,000 miles of stone wall. Here in the United States, in this one little corner of the United States, we constructed over three times that amount in a span of about 200 years. Why we don't get more credit for this amazing accomplishment, I don't know. Perhaps it's because so much of our older work is hidden away in the woods, in reforested areas where it was first laid down uh, and where it continues to sleep in many places, uh, awaiting uh, whatever stone walls wait for uh, in terms of their own day of judgment. However, the second wonderful thing about this number has nothing to do with the number at all, but rather with the year in which it was arrived at. Because if you could pick a year in which we reached a kind of tipping point, and began to lose more stone wall than we were gaining, you could do a lot worse than guess at 1871. By that time, a confluence of events that had been developing throughout the 19th century came to a bit of a head uh, and brought an end to the widespread vernacular building of dry laid stone structures, and it happened rather quickly. These forces included, of course, the Industrial Revolution, which created all kinds of wage jobs that began to draw young people off the farms and into jobs in factory towns like Manchester and Lowell, Massachusetts and other places. It included the Civil War, which pulled a great many farmers off their land, killed off quite a few of them in battle, but perhaps more importantly taught many others during the course of their travels in the army that there are places in this country where the topsoil is six feet deep, not six inches deep. And therefore, they came home just long enough to throw their tools and their families into a wagon and head off for Ohio or Missouri or the upper Midwest or any place where farming did not quite seem like such an act of desperation or insanity. The upshot was that we began to hemorrhage population out of uh, our upland towns especially. Towns lost population during the course of the latter third of the 19th century at a steady rate to the point where a great many towns uh, in our part of the world still to this day have not managed to return to the populations that they enjoyed in 1830, which we can take as the peak period of the small-scale New England agriculture uh, that produced the uh, agricultural landscape that we're also fond of today, along with its many thousands of miles uh, of stone wall. It just so happens as well that other forces came into play in the immediate vicinity, historically speaking, of the creation of this report. The invention of barbed wire, for instance, uh, occurred in 1868, just a few years before the report uh, was issued. It coincided with a general switchover in livestock emphasis from the sheep raising, which had been such a mainstay both here in Vermont and in my own state of New Hampshire, uh, for many, many years. Uh, and it also took advantage of the uh, Industrial Revolution's uh, main contribution to uh, the end of stone wall building, uh, which was, of course, that barbed wire, which appeared and began to uh, be erected all along the old stone wall fence lines. Whenever you see an old piece of barbed wire lying along an old stone wall, you can count on the fact that on the day that wire went up, any maintenance that wall was receiving came to a swift end. So we can almost date the beginning of the deterioration of our network of uh, old stone walls by <laughs> simply looking at when the wire went on uh, onto them. At any rate, um, uh, in addition to all these other forces, it was the farmers themselves who began to spell the end of the period of peak stone, dry stone construction. Uh, and they did this because of the model that was brought here. Uh, by European farmers when they first began to settle New England land early in the 17th century. Uh, uh, sorry, the 18th century. Uh, no, it was the 17th century. I don't know why I keep getting this wrong again and again. Uh, the um, model that was brought here by those farmers was a model that was essentially medieval. It was that small fields produced best. And so when uh, farmers came into any given uh, area and began to break it out of the uh, old growth forest that was covering it before they arrived, uh, they tended to divide the land up into small acreages of two and three and five acres. This was because all work was done by hand. So you had a reasonable chance of completing your plowing, your planting, your mowing uh, in a single day on acreage that was relatively small uh, if you were working only with hand tools. Now imagine for a minute that you are mowing hay on a tidy little three acre piece lying nicely bound in by old stone walls. When you're mowing with a scythe, you can literally step right up to the edges of those walls, can't you, and cut every blade of grass in the place. 
But by the end of the 19th century, quite a few farmers were no longer cutting their hay that way. Instead, they were dragging six or eight foot cutter bars behind teams of horses or oxen. When you're dragging a cutter bar, you've got to start turning 20 feet before every corner to get the machine around. And that meant that now there were four useless triangles of land in every single one of these tidy little fields. That's why by the end of the 19th century, quite a few farmers who in many cases were dealing with stone walls that had been erected in the first place by their own fathers and grandfathers or even partly by themselves, digging large trenches beside those walls and dumping the walls into them to bury them below the surface of the ground and make their uh, pieces more responsive to the new machine agriculture that had come along and taken over. This process continued even as New England agriculture began to fall into a kind of depression. This lasted for quite a long time. In addition to population loss, thousands and thousands of acres of formerly productive farmland were abandoned. Uh, many farmers simply walked away from their places uh, and uh, left them forever. And we sank into a kind of classic New England malaise that has been noticed uh, by the national press. What's wrong with New England, said magazine articles. It seems to be a kind of uh, new Appalachia uh, with all its vitality leaching out of it, and young people leaving in droves, uh, old uh, farm fields reverting to forest uh, here, there, and everywhere, everything disappearing. This condition lasted here for quite a long time. In fact, we didn't really begin to come out of it until the Great Depression. It's been said by some theorists that the Depression was actually good for New England. My own parents, however, who lived through the Depression here would not take that view. But the Depression did do one fine thing for us. It dragged the rest of the country down into the hole where we'd already been living for 40 or 50 years, thus evening the playing field and making it possible for New England to start to bounce back. And it's extraordinary how many things we now consider rather important to the New England economy and, uh, and even to its way of life uh, got their start in the middle of the Depression. And now I'm talking about things like the ski industry, the summer theater industry, and also symbolic events too. For instance, the first edition of Yankee Magazine, that great voice of New England virtue, uh, made its debut in 1935, right in the middle of the Depression, where the iconic American play, Our Town, which is produced over and over again by high schools throughout the region, uh, and other companies too, uh, and made its Broadway appearance uh, in 1938, just uh, as the Depression was uh, reaching its peak. Well, why am I talking about all this in a lecture ostensibly devoted to stone walls? Because that long cultural and economic malaise that we fell into toward the end of the 19th century tended to act as a kind of preservative for a great many elements of the old New England infrastructure that was agriculturally related. And I'm talking now about beautiful village centers like this one and the architecture that went along with them, certainly the old stone walls uh, and other features of the agricultural landscape as well. Because so little came along to take its place as the uh, great era of small-scale agriculture began to fade away here, we ended up preserving quite a bit of the old infrastructure that had been uh, built in the first place to support it. And the, as a result, uh, a great many of the historic features of the landscape uh, are still here for us to enjoy and learn from today, uh, only because uh, our um, uh, immediate ancestors of the, say, two or three generations ago had to live through uh, such a long period of decline. Well, how, are these, how did we get all these stone walls in the first place? You know, it is uh, commonly thought by many people that they must have been built up over a great long stretch of historical time because the network is so extensive and it simply seems to be ubiquitous across the entire region. Uh, in fact, however, historically speaking, we acquired our network of stone walls in a remarkably short period uh, of historical time. One estimate says that uh, it, the peak period of building, and this is the generally accepted uh, uh, description of this, uh, lasted from, for about 50 years, uh, running from about 1775 to 1825. Uh, it was the immediate aftermath of the revolution uh, that really saw an uptick uh, in the amount of stone wall that was being built throughout the region. Uh, uh, and uh, although the stone walls certainly were built before those dates and plenty of them afterward as well. This was a period of time when virtually everyone who lived on a small farm throughout the New England region was engaged in one way or another, at one time or another during the year, uh, with the gathering and transport of stone uh, or with the assembling of uh, stone structures of many different kinds. The 
uh, one of the reasons that we got all these walls in, uh, in such a hurry uh, was not just because of the urgency of the farmers who uh, set out to build them, uh, but also because the first choice uh, of farmers for fencing during the days of early days of settlement when the forest was being uh, cut down, and uh, we're talking here now about survival rather than uh, uh, sophisticated development of the landscape, uh, their first choice for fencing wasn't stone. It was the great mess you get when you have to cut down a whole bunch of virgin forest. And so it consisted of split rails uh, and especially of pulled stumps uh, that were lined up in great forbidding rows uh, at the edges of various fields and pastures uh, in order to create barriers. At the same time, however, these farmers discovered what all of you know quite well, which is that we live in a remarkably stony part of the country. Uh, and so, uh, along with uh, the clearing of the forest itself uh, and the erection of these uh, organic fencing lines, they also found themselves obligated to move enormous amounts of surface stone uh, off the land in order to be able to plow or plant. Um, uh, and so uh, what they tended to do was take all of this stone out to the edges of the fields or pastures they were creating, uh, throw it up against the organic fencing. Uh, of course, as uh, the clearing uh, proceeded apace and they f eventually uh, uh, created the uh, wide open farming landscape of the early 19th century, uh, they began to run low on supplies of the kinds of organic material that they'd been using for their fences. At the same time, they uh, realized that they had all kinds of material for a new form of fencing already lined up on those fence lines in the form of all that waste stone that they had piled up uh, right beside the uh, old, now rotting uh, stump and rail fences. And so uh, the task of beginning to build our network of stone walls consisted really of simply reorganizing stone they'd already moved into place. This is one of the reasons why we got so much of our network in such a hurry. The other main reason was an event that occurred uh, in the early years of the 19th century. This is one that's quite familiar to Vermonters. It was the importation of the first merino sheep. Uh, into our part of the country. You were talking before about uh, the uh, amazing Steve Taylor who gives wonderful presentations, especially one uh, about this uh, so-called sheep craze that occurred uh, after about 1811 or so when that animal became the primary uh, animal of uh, a great many New England farms and, and uh, made it possible for quite a few, and, uh, certainly um, uh, many here in Vermont and also uh, throughout the rest of New England. Uh, to do very, very well raising these sheep. The advent of the merino uh, also obligated farmers uh, to enclose thousands and thousands of acres uh, for sheep raising uh, in a great big hurry. And so after about 1811 or so, uh, the uh, mere mania of the former energy being put into stone wall building became something of an obsession. Uh, and we began to see uh, enormous mileage in stone walls being put up uh, during about a 30-year period, uh, right up until about 1840 or so, uh, when the sheep industry uh, began to develop uh, uh, some uh, little problems, which eventually uh, led to its complete collapse. There, were, uh, there was a bit of an uptick. Uh, in the run-up to the Civil War because of the need for uniforms, but after the uh, war was over, we began to enter that long spell of sleepy time uh, that was so characteristic of New England in the late 19th century, and uh, resulted in some very vivid descriptions of a place that had lost all of its energy and vitality, say in the novels of Edith Horton uh, and in other literature uh, of the time. Well, how are these walls put together? There is, for you Star Trek fans, a prime directive in stone wall building, and it is this. If you are proposing to put together a dry stone structure and you hope that it will last as long as it's capable of lasting, because contrary to popular mythology, New England stone walls are not permanent structures. Every single one of them falls down eventually. And so, what your goal is when you set out to build one is to build something that's going to fall down later, not sooner. <laughs> You do this by following the prime directive, which is, uh, in this aphoristic rule, to place one stone over two throughout the structure, or two over one. This is a shorthand way uh, of saying that the reason these walls hold themselves together is because their individual rows of stones, or courses, if you will, are cross-hatched over one another so that they sit uh, row by row over the joints of the stones below and not directly on top of them. To place stones in a wall directly on top of one another, 
in straight lines is called stack bonding. And it is bad because it divides the wall into segregated sections, which can then come apart over time under the many forces that are striving to pull them down from the moment they are put, first put in place. We do have earthquakes here in New England from time to time, you know. They're not very spectacular by California standards, but they're enough. Just a couple of weeks ago in my own town of Hopkinton, uh, down in New Hampshire, we had a massive killer of an earthquake, a an enormous and mighty 2.9 tembler. It rippled through town. It was barely feelable by a human being. But every stone in every wall felt it go by. This wouldn't matter if stones were proactive creatures with a desire to help humans by staying where they are put. But the fact is that stones, every stone in the world has an ambition, a personal ambition, to sink to the center of the earth as soon as possible. It's extraordinarily patient about waiting for an opportunity to fulfill this ambition. When one comes along, it takes it with alacrity and immediately. When that earthquake came across Hopkinton, every stone and every wall down there said, hey, here's my chance. I can get a little closer to the center of the earth. And if there was any space around that stone and the structure that it occupied, it slipped or slid or otherwise contrived to slide its way into that uh, new space that was a little bit closer uh, to the ground. And as it did that, it deprived other stones in its immediate vicinity of the support and, uh, and uh, stability that they had previously enjoyed. And then they too, uh, in some cases, moved just a little bit. This process is not just precipitated by our occasional earthquakes, but rather by a great many other things too, including the way that water is moving under a wall, uh, the expansion of tree roots from trees that are growing a little too close to it, uh, the tunneling of animals underneath it, changes in the uh, composition of the soil uh, that create uneven settling from one part of the uh, wall to another. All kinds of things are always moving stones around within a wall and eventually loosening them up. This is why stone walls are like people. They tend to spread out as they get older. Uh, <laughs> occupy a little more space than they did before. And eventually, of course, all those uh, structural relationships among individual stones within the wall uh, begin to uh, come apart and the wall uh, begins to fall down in sections. The uh, destruction of stone walls by these uh, forces is why they all require regular maintenance. And it's a major reason why so much of our old stonework uh, these days looks the way it does, because it has not received uh, the uh, regular maintenance that it was re used to receiving back in the days uh, when the walls themselves were important parts of the agricultural landscape. Uh, this is uh, also a reason why so many of our walls are half to a third the height they once were. You know, the standard size for a livestock bearing stone wall in New England was about four feet uh, during the peak of their uh, use as uh, active parts of the farm landscape. Most of the walls we see around the countryside now are half to uh, even a third that height. Uh, not simply because they've uh, lost stone toppling off the tops, but because they've also lost height from the bottom. You know, stone walls sitting in reforested area, uh, uh, areas collect all the leaves and sticks that blow through the woods, just like a snow fence collects snow. And, and of course, that uh, material then rots down and forms new soil right in the immediate vicinity of the footprint of the wall. Uh, causing that uh, soil to rise. So rising grades in reforested areas have added, uh, in many cases, as much as a foot or two of new soil up against the bottoms of these walls. And that means that they are losing height uh, from both top and bottom uh, as they age. If you scrape away some of that material from some of our old walls out in reforested places, uh, many times you will find uh, a, s a layer of uh, two or three courses uh, of stone that appear to have been set into a, a trench uh, in order to bear up the wall as a kind of foundation. Uh, but in fact, the walls, uh, like most of the old agricultural walls, uh, were built directly on the ground when they were first constructed uh, and have simply uh, been buried from the bottom up uh, by those rising grades over time. Well, the building of uh, New England stone walls uh, is a little bit different uh, from what we see in most of the rest of the world uh, for two important reasons. One is the stone itself. In most parts of the world uh, where dry stone wall building is common, uh, 
the available stone supply is relatively homogeneous with respect to its array of shapes and sizes. In other words, one stone looks a lot like another. Uh, here in New England, however, uh, uh, that is not the case at all. What we have here is an enormous mess uh, of every shape and size you could possibly imagine, from a ping pong ball to a Volkswagen bus, uh, all smashed up together uh, in a great chaos uh, that uh, is mystifying to uh, stone wall builders from other parts of the world. So the first uh, uh, difference that we see in New England stone wall building uh, is this crazy mess uh, of different kinds uh, and shapes of stone. Uh, the second thing uh, that matters is the attitudes of the people who built them. In most parts uh, of the world where lots and lots of stone walls get built, the reason for it is because they need walls. And that's the, that's the main and only reason. Here in New England, however, there's an ancillary objective with the stone wall building, especially in the uh, uh, historical period uh, when we were developing this farm landscape of ours. Uh, and that is, of course, to get rid of as much stone as possible. Uh, this has uh, an enormous effect on the way our walls look. Uh, it means, for instance, that many of them are much overbuilt for the jobs they actually have to do. They're thicker, taller, wider. Uh, and if you're talking about things like foundations or retaining walls, uh, they are uh, in the hidden parts of those structures, uh, absolutely crammed with enormous, huge, enormous amounts of stone uh, that you would not see had the walls been built in England or Ireland or uh, Greece or Italy. The uh, uh, overbuilding of our uh, stone walls also makes another thing possible, and that is uh, the use of uh, untold amounts of junk stone that the more sophisticated builders of other kinds of traditions uh, would find completely unusable uh, and wouldn't even bother with. Here in New England, however, because we had to get rid of so much of it, we found ways to use those rounded cannonball type shapes and uh, a lot of other uh, impossible uh, uh, configurations as well. Uh, and one way to use them is to overbuild the wall uh, that you're working on, so much so that it has uh, huge amounts of uh, empty interior space that can be filled with that junk stone uh, that doesn't hold together very well, but, but is perfectly fine to use as filler uh, in the middle of very, very large projects. This uh, all